Hi there, I'm Dogs broadcaster Sam Brief. And I'm reporter and host Casey Standahar. And we've got a special treat for you today. You know Dogs manager Butch Hobson. He's the only manager in franchise history. And he had a heck of a playing and managing career in the majors and minors. And we've got a trip down memory lane for you. That's right, Sam, from his collegiate career to his MLB debut and the lessons he's learned as a father and coach, we have it all here in this interview. Yeah, this dude's memory is absurdly good. So you'll love the interview and the rich stories that Butch has for you. So without further ado, here's our exclusive interview with Butch Hobson. My grandmother, Mama Lee, uh, was my mom's mom. Used to flip me rocks when I had a little stick, and I would hit rocks all the time. I, I, baseball was a love. I loved baseball. Um, didn't want to do anything but baseball. But when you grow up in Alabama and you don't play football, Mama don't feed you. And especially when your dad is the football coach, and your dad played at Alabama. Um, it was pretty much expected of me to play football. And after probably never really played peewee football, and got into the seventh grade and played junior high and uh, fell in love with football. Um, you know, and it was, it was kind of a, an experience with my dad being the coach because when I was in the eighth grade, I was on the varsity because we only had like 22 players on the team, this little small town in Alabama where he was coaching. And, I remember this guy named Boyd Pugh used to hit me and it hurt me so bad and it just got to the point where I don't know if I really want to play this game. And I told my dad one day after practice, I said, Dad, I'm not sure that I want to play football. And he looked at me and he said one thing. He said, well, son, that's okay, but I just want you to know you're the only other quarterback I got. So that pretty much said I'm going to play football and I remember making a tackle on a guy and I just closed my eyes and I hit him as hard as I could. And it must've been a good lick because my dad came over and picked me up and patted me on the back. And from that point on, football became a part of my life. I never gave up on baseball because I loved it so much. So, um, but you know, growing up and just having the love for wanting to go out and hit a baseball was something that I really enjoy doing. But you played college football under Alabama's Bear Bryant. What memory from your playing career in college football sticks out the most to you? Well, probably Coach Bryant was a tremendous football coach and he was a tremendous man. He cared about his players. Um, I mean, I would go see him every offseason. He knew what I hit, how many times I struck out, everything about my season. But probably the thing that sticks out the most because of the motivator that he was, and he was a tremendous motivator. Uh, after my junior year, uh, I had a really good Orange Bowl. I was a backup quarterback to Terry Davis. And we played Nebraska for the national championship, and, and I had a really good game the second half. Terry got hurt, and even though we were getting demolished, uh, I had a good game. So it was one of those things that everybody said, you know, you could be the next quarterback for the University of Alabama next year. And so I was in summer school with the quarterbacks. They all, we always went to summer school and started just getting in shape. And um, I went to a Cincinnati Reds tryout camp about two weeks before two-a-days started. And um, George Zuro and Phil Noto, Cincinnati Reds guys, said, but you got a, you might have a future in this game. Because I continued to play baseball at Alabama. You might have a future in this game, but you know, our advice to you is focus on baseball. So that meant my making a decision to take the fall of my, my, my senior year and not play football and focus on baseball. And I made that decision, which was a very big decision, especially when you play football for the University of Alabama and your dad played football for the University of Alabama. And, and uh, so I made the decision. I talked to my dad. I said, I think I want to give up football this fall, Dad, and f concentrate on baseball because I knew I didn't have a future in football. My dad was fine. He said, he said you're a grown man. You do what you want to do, but you got to go see the man. So I knew that that meant I have going to have to go sit down with the man and tell him what I wanted to do. And the motivator that he was, I, I called uh, his secretary, and I can't remember her. It's been a long time ago. 
remember her name, and I said, I'd really like to see Coach Bryant. And she said, uh, she said, just a minute. So Coach Bryant will see you tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock in his office because Coach Bryant got to the Coliseum early. And I'm going, 5 o'clock. And it was hot and humid. This is in August. And so I went up to his office, and his office is like, humongous, and I'm sitting in a chair, sunk down, and Bear Bryant was 6'5". People don't realize he was a tall man. And his office looked out on the baseball field. He had his back to me, smoking a cigarette, pot pell mail, non-filters, and I said, Coach, I just think I want to focus on baseball and give up this year of football. And he took a drag off his cigarette, turned around, spit some of that tobacco out, and he said, well, Butch, from what I've seen of your baseball playing, you'll be back playing football for me next year. And teed me off. I mean, it was freezing in there, and all of a sudden, I'm hot. I didn't recognize at the point in time what he was doing. But he was motivating me to show him that I could make it as a baseball player. Uh, but the kind of man he was, he said, he said Butch, I'm going to keep you on football scholarship which might be an NCAA violation today, I don't know. But you can't live in Bryant Hall where the football players stay. Uh, you got to live over in Mary Burke with all the soccer players and the tennis players and the baseball players. But if you don't get drafted, I want you to come back and play your last year of football for me. So that's where it happened. I, I focused on baseball. I had a tremendous 1973 spring season. Got drafted in the eighth round by the Boston Red Sox. Still didn't sign until August because I hadn't made up my mind, you know, do I want to go back, do I want to go back? But uh, my first wife was pregnant with my oldest daughter, and, and I knew I had to get on with my life. So I signed in August and spent a year, a month in, in A-ball, and then two and a half years later, I'm in the big leagues playing for Boston. I know Bear Bryant's motivation, like that fire he lit, stayed with you and still does stay with you. Okay, so you walked out of his office that day. What were you feeling? When I walked out the door, Mal Moore, who was the athletic director for years, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago, was the secondary coach when I was playing in the secondary of sophomore year, and he was the quarterback coach. And he stopped me, and he was outside hearing what was going on. And he stopped me, and he says, do you realize that you are giving up the opportunity to be the starting quarterback for the University of Alabama? I said, I do. I said, but coach, I don't have a future in this game football, and I might have in baseball. And he said, okay, I understand. So he said if you didn't get drafted, you'd go back to Alabama to play football. Then you did get drafted. So take us through draft day. When and where were you? Well, I think the draft was June the 7th back then, and um, Milt Bowling was my scout. And, of course, I know we were at the – my dad and I with my family were at the house and got a call from Milt – um, that I was drafted in the eighth round, um, and they offered me $10,000 signing bonus. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, at that point in time, I, I just wasn't sure, you know, was that enough money to keep me from going back to Alabama and playing football? And I spent two months, and I went to just thinking about it. I didn't sign. I went and played in this, for this team in, from Ponchatoula, Louisiana. We went up to Alaska and played the Gold Panthers, and while I was up there, I just said, you know, I need to go home and sign, and that's what I did. So you were drafted by the Red Sox in 73, and your MLB debut didn't come until 75, is that correct? So what emotions were you feeling when you had that first MLB at bat? You know, I was a September call-up, because I was in double-A in 75, and then, you know, they, they called up guys from the minor leagues. And they only called up two that year, and it was myself and Andy Merchant, another Alabama boy. Uh, actually, he played at Auburn, but we don't say that word around Alabama too much. Uh, but um, he was a very good friend of mine. And, you know, to get the call up, you know, when my manager, Bill Slack, called me in the office after the last game and says, you're going to Boston. Um, I went up. Um, my first game was I pinch ran for Carl Yaskrimski in Milwaukee. And really didn't really get on it bad until the last game of the season because the Red Sox were in the, they ended up winning the East and, you know, um, won the American League Championship. Last year they played the World Series against Cincinnati. So um, tremendous 
dream that I had a dream all the, all those years to play in the major leagues. I used to hit rocks in the cornfield with a broomstick, and I was Roger Maris, and I was Mickey Mantle, and you know it was just something that 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 I had a dream and was fortunate enough to be, you know, and it, people don't realize it, you know, getting to the big leagues is, is, is very difficult. And it's not, I want to say it's, you've got some, a lot of times to be at the right place at the right time. Uh, and I happened to be coming up as the third baseman that, and, and then the Rico was at the end of his career and I was doing very well in the minor leagues. and. You know, had not Rico not be at that point in time of his age, then you know I might not have ever got that opportunity. I might have had to go somewhere else to get that opportunity. So, being at the right place at the right time is is, is big. Um, and went to instructional league and went to AAA in '76. Was called up for two weeks. Rico had an ear infection. Um, my first home run was an inside the park home run off Rudy May in Fenway Park. I was there two weeks, then sent back down to AAA, and then uh, they fired Daryl Johnson, and Don Zimmer took over, and the first thing he did is he called me back up. So I ended up playing 75 games in Boston in 76. Were there any moments in that roller coaster of being called up, called down, where you were like, maybe I made the wrong decision, football's still calling me? Did you always know that you were in the right place? Uh, yes, I did, because I was, I, was having, I was having success. Had I not been having success, I might have felt that way, but... I was having good years in the minor leagues. I really had a, a really strong year in 76, and um, I think I had 25 home runs in AAA, and I hit eight or nine in Boston in the time that I was there in 76. Um, so I knew I was in a good spot, and I loved Boston. I didn't want to be anywhere else. Your first home run, unique one, and I know Reggie Jackson played a big role in it. So tell us the story of your first career home run. Well, Rudy May was pitching. I hit a ball to left center, and it hit the Paul Blair was in center, Reggie was in right, and Ken Singleton was in left. And the ball was up the wall, probably about ten feet. And Paul goes up to try to catch it, and the the wall back then had like seams. You know, it was probably what twenty five where the the padding was, uh, or whatever the makeup of the wall was, and it hit that seam and ricocheted back behind Paul. And so I had to do a head first slide into home, into home plate, got the home run. Well, the next day, I'm going to third base, and Reggie comes walking by third base. He said, you had a real good time last night, didn't you, Hobson? I said, yes, sir, I did. So it, was a, it was a tremendous feeling. And, um, you know, playing with tremendous players and being on a team where, you know, I hit night because that's where I belonged with the people we had in Carlton Fist and Dwight Evans and Jim Rice and Freddie Lynn and George Scott and the name goes on uh, of the people that, you know, that, that I played with. And uh, I was a very blessed man to be able to have the opportunity that so many millions of other baseball players don't get to have, and that's to play in the big leagues. You're the young guy with all these future Hall of Famers, right? You were the September call-up, new guy, new guy. At what point do you realize, oh, wow, I'm, I'm Butch Hobson. That name carries weight. I'm a legit major leaguer. Well, you know, I, I want to say I was a pretty humble guy. Um, I continued to take two buckets of ground balls every day before a game. I worked hard to get there, and I knew that I was going to have to work hard to stay there because there's another player in the minor leagues that wants my spot. Um, but, you know, all these gentlemen that I talked about were tremendous teammates. Um, our, I mean, they always said the thing about Boston players where they always, they didn't ride the bus uh, to the airport. They all took cabs and they took cabs to the hotel. It's not true. You know, we were a family and, um, you know, listening to George Scott and Louis Tiant tell stories and, um, you know, just being around these players coming off of the 1975 World Series, which at that point in time was one of the best ever. You know, Carlton Fist home run, waving it fair, Bernie Carbo hitting the home run to tie the game in game six. It, Carlton then hits the home run. So uh, there were a lot of big name players that I was fortunate to play with. And, um, you know, you Carl Yaskrimski, and I left his name out, Hall of Famer, 
Uh, I was on the field when, I mean, I was in the dugout, you know, when we were playing the Yankees, he got his 3,000 hit. That's a tremendous thing in my life to be there when that happens. And um, he, they put me in a locker right next to me. And I mean, right next to him. And the first time that in 75, you know, I was sitting in my locker and there comes Yaz, you know, and everybody knows who Yaz is. He looked at me and he said, Hobson, I'm going to tell you how to hit in the big leagues. I said, I'm listening. He said, swing hard in case you hit it. <laughs> that was his advice. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's a tremendous feeling to, to walk into Fenway Park for the first time. It's a great place. What do you remember about that, getting on the field for the first time? Uh, I was very nervous. <laughs> And this was batting practice. It wasn't a game, you know, because people weren't in the stands yet. You know, Fenway's a small ballpark, and, and there's 30, 37,000 is what it, what it held. It might hold a little bit more with the monster seats and up on right field, whatever they call that. Um, but people are right on top of you. It's, a, it's like a, just a real close-knit ballpark. So, um, you know, I bet played football in front of 50 and 60,000, but I had never really played baseball until that first time in front of that many people. Um, but it was it was awesome, you know, being in being in being in the ballpark that Ted Williams played in. Pretty cool. What are some of the pitchers that you really enjoyed facing, or were some of the toughest pitchers? I could not hit Jack Morris. I asked Zimmer one day. I said, "Why do you play me against Jack Morris? I can't hit him." He said, "Well, Hobson, you might get lucky today." <laughs> um, I had a lot of success against Jim Palmer. Um, there's some pitchers you have success against, you know. Facing Nolan Ryan was a, a, a very nervous experience the first time I faced him. Um, the first pitch that I heard <laughs> was a strike. <laughs> I don't know if I saw it. It was like yes. 102. And actually, in the next one, I swung and missed. And, and the first hit I ever got off of him, he threw me a changeup, and I hit it over the scoreboard in left center in Anaheim. I think that's the only hit I probably ever got off of Nolan Ryan. But, I, you know... Um, I was, it was my rookie year in 77, well it wasn't my rookie year, but was still, I was still a rookie because I had too many at bats in 76 to be classified a rookie in 77. And Gaylord Perry's pitching for Texas and Burt Blylevin was pitching for Texas and Burt Blylevin on Friday night, had, he had the greatest curveball ever, you know, are you the best. And so his curveball, you really had to stay in there, you know. And fastball got away and hit Burleson in the helmet. He wasn't throwing at him. It just got away from him. That happens. And um, so the next day, Gaylord's pitching, the Saturday day game in Boston. And I'm throwing Yaz is next to him, getting ready for infield. And Gaylord comes out, and he's got a he's he's got a cup of coffee, and he's getting ready to go to the bullpen. And he, reaches in his back pocket. This is when he was throwing the puff ball. And he pulled it out of his back pocket and threw it to the ass. It had flour all over it. So I'm standing there, and I'm, there's Gaylord Perry. And, and um, he said, hey, Rook. I said, yes, sir, Mr. Perry. He said, if you lean out over the plate and looking for that curveball, the fastball will reach up and bite you right on the ear. And I went, I'm going to be facing it. And he, Gaylord Perry was a big donkey. <laughs> and... Uh, First pitch he threw me, dropped down and threw me a sidearm slider, and I, at what we call butt out, hit a double down, past Buddy Bell down the left field line, and I get on second, and Gaylord's looking at me, and he says, I'm going to get you. <laughs> That's how it was when I played. So yeah. I, I had to face, you know, there's, there's pitchers you have success against. There's some pitchers that you, that you struggle against because I can't pick the ball up and stuff like that. But, you know, I, the fact that I got to be there and be a part of, the greatest game, in my in my opinion, there is 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 pretty awesome. Second at bat, Gaylord Perry did he get you? No, 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 no. He he was just intimidating me. But I do know that I had a ball a home when Catfish was signed as a free agent for New York, and I had a home run to left field off of him. Thurman Munch is catching, and Thurman liked me for some reason. I'm not going to tell you what they what he called me. I don't think it's good for me to say it, but in a loving way, and. Uh, I hit a home run to left field, and I go to the plate the next bat, and and then uh, Thurman says, "You know what's fixing to happen, don't you?" I said, "Yes, sir, I do." 
He threw an 80 mile an hour fastball and plunked me in the ribs just to let me know, rookie, don't get too comfortable. You talk about your love for the Red Sox, your time there, and your love for Fenway, but you went on to also play for the then California Angels and the Yankees. So out of the three teams that you played in the majors with, what team or what experience was the best for you? What had to be Boston. Uh, you know, I was traded to the Angels in 81, Burleson, who was one of my best friends, and he played shortstop and I was at third, and we were traded together over to California, and you know, I'm an Alabama boy going to the West Coast. Um, you know, I had a so-so year. With that was a strike year. You know, we didn't uh, um, miss about a month of the season of August, and then came back in September, and then was traded to the Yankees, which I didn't really like because uh, Red Sox. Red, back then, the Red Sox Yankees series was a war. There was no there was no love lost between the two teams. Um, and so, going to the Yankees in '82 was a very tough year for the Yankees, and. But I got to play with Dave Winfield and Greg Nettles and, and uh, Goose Gossage and uh, Willie Randolph and Bucky Dent, and, you know, and a lot of those great names uh, that, that were there uh, with the Yankees. And, but, you know, um, but Boston's my number one. It's so fascinating. You were trained for seven seasons to hate the Yankees. Right? You go to Yankee Stadium, they're the enemy. They're booing you. And then suddenly you're in a clubhouse at Yankee Stadium putting on a pinstripe jersey mm -hmm. for you. The thing that I really regretted was when we went back to Boston. Because I didn't, I mean, I didn't have any say-so in it. But Boston and, and the Yankees, the Red Sox and the Yankees, was, like I said, it was a war. When, that, when those games, there was, it was intense. It was, it was getting knocked on your butt. It was getting, you know, run over at third base or you running over the uh, – Bucky or Willie on double plays. I mean, it was it was no love lost between the two teams. And my biggest fear was how were the fans in Boston because they, I was a very, I'm not saying this, Pat, my, but I was a very popular player with the Red Sox fans. And going back, I just wasn't sure how they were going to respond. But I knew they would. I, 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 they responded how I felt that they would, and, and uh, they treated me well. They didn't treat me like a Yankee. Good. So you've been the manager of many other teams. After the Red Sox, you, you managed you know, some minor league teams throughout your career, including right here in town, the Kane County Cougars. What was that experience like before joining the Dogs? Well, I, um, I still tried to continue my playing career in 86. I signed with the, back with the Yankees and went to spring training, and I really had a tremendous spring training and was scheduled to go back to Columbus in AAA. And I tried to run over a catcher in a spring training game, and I, he dodged me, and I tripped, tripped over his, his uh, legs and landed on my, 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 my chest, and I cracked three ribs. And so they sent me home and said, we want you to join the team. You know, when you heal up, join the team in Columbus. And at that point in time, I knew that that was not going to happen, that when I got home, I would be released. And I was released, but I kept working out and thinking that maybe I might get a call didn't get the call. I got a call from the Mets about midway through the summer and said, we, we would like you to manage our A-ball team uh, next year in 1987. And I accepted that job because I knew I wanted to stay in the game. Um, I was the son of a football coach. I played for a great football coach. Uh, I think I, I knew I had it in my blood to continue in the game of baseball that I loved. And so, uh, you know, I, I got my start in 1987. And I've been doing it ever since. Um, I've been an independent ball since 2000. I love independent ball. I've loved the opportunities to be able to help players get back to organizations. You know, except for the stand in 17 with Kane County, which I loved. It was a, it's an awesome place, and, and still have a lot of friends there when I, we go back over there to play them. Um, but the, the story is kind of funny because, and and, and Sean Hunter and, and Trish and the whole front office and all of you, I love y'all so much. It's so, it's kind of I don't want to use I don't know if the word's ironic. I'm, I don't know. I'm from Alabama. I ain't real sure. But we were we made the playoffs in Kane County, and we had two days off. And Rick White and Sean are very good friends. Rick White's the commissioner or the president of the Atlantic League. And I knew Rick very well. So he called me and he said, I have a friend, because they're neighbors in Colorado. I have a friend that's starting a team not too far from you in Chicago, 
the Chicago Dog, and they're building a stadium, and he would like for you to come down and just give him some ideas about independent ball. So I did. I came down, and when they had the office right up here in the Blood Source building, and had my hard hat on, walking around and seeing the construction and things it was beautiful. And I'll never forget we're standing up on the uh, one of the decks of one of the party decks up there, and I looked and I'm watching, looking at everything, and 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 I asked Sean. I said, "Who's who gets the third base dugout?" Because I knew where the locker room was, and he said, "Which one do you want?" And I went, "Wow." And so, and I was still under contract with the Diamondbacks at the time. And after I got after I got home, the Diamondbacks called and said, "We're going a different direction." And um, I called Sean. He says, "We'll send you a ticket. We want you to come up. Let's sit down and talk." I came up. We went over to actually we were sitting over at King's Restaurant. And he said, we want you to be the manager of the Chicago Dogs. Because I told Sean, I said, you know what? This was before I ever took it. I said, whoever gets to manage this team is a very lucky man. And I just happened to be that lucky man. Your coaching career now has dwarfed your playing career, right? You played for quite a long time, but now you've coached for decades since. Thousands of players, including your own son. You've made a big impact on a lot of people. I'm curious what you think Bear Bryant would say to you right now? We know Coach Bryant on Sundays would, we would have, after he expected us to go to church, we would, uh, we would have uh, to, uh, like two o'clock go to the, to the Coliseum to the, to the projection room. They're big. They're like, not like a theater, but they're for that time of, in that era was, was pretty big projection room. We would watch the, the Saturday game day films and every Saturday, Coach Bryant would get up, and when he stood up, you could hear a pin drop. He would get to the door, he'd have a cigarette in his mouth, he'd turn around and look at us and say, boys, I want you to go call your mama, tell her you're all right, and I love every one of you, every Sunday. And you can ask any one of those guys out there that I tell them I love them. That's something that I took and I have, Peter Gammons wrote when I got, lost my job in Boston that Butch Hobson was fired, was not, renewed because he loved his players too much. If that's the reason, then I'm okay with that. And I you manage your son, Casey, and you get to watch him play the game that you both love. You grew up loving it, now he loves it. How rewarding is that experience for you as a father? Well, I think, I mean, any manager that has the opportunity to manage, have his son on the team is a pretty awesome experience. Um, the first time that, that was he, in, in 2016, he was released by Toronto. It was a big draft pick, and, and uh, they just, you know, went a different direction. And so I said, why don't you come play for me in Lancaster? Lancaster, that's how you pronounce it. You can't, say, yep. you can't say Lancaster, you got to say Lancaster. And so he came and played for me, had a tremendous season. I knew he was going to get signed in the off season, but we got to the last three games of the season, and we were in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Neither team was in the playoffs, and Louis Rodriguez was the was the manager in, in uh, Bridgeport. He played for me in Boston years and years. I think there's a lot of guys in baseball that have played for me. <laughs> That's how old I am. And so this is Friday night, and he's Casey's at the batting, getting his bat, getting ready to go ahead. And I came up, to, I walked up, I said, I got this crazy idea. I was 65 years old at the time. I said, what do you think about this? I'm going to activate myself Sunday because I have a spot on the roster. And I'm going to play third while you play first, and I'm going to hit second while you hit third. And we're going to do it for one inning. What do you think? He said, go for it. And I did. <laughs> I spent an hour in the cage because I hadn't picked up a bat in I don't know how long. I spent an hour in the cage swinging. I got the game started. I could barely pick my bat up. <laughs> And I struck out, of course. I, you know, I, uh, they, I knew Louis said he's going to throw you up with fastballs. Uh, Alabama who had pitched for the Pittsburgh Pirates, was throwing. He threw when he won about 87 right out in the middle. And I wanted to see a pitch, and he threw it. And I'm going, I can't hit that anymore. So I took another one. The umpire called right back. I turned around. I said, ball's low. I should have just got thrown out right there. So then, then here comes the slider that I never could hit anyway. But then now i got to go out to third base. And... Louis had instructed everybody, the right-handers, to hit the ball to the right side and the left-handers to pull it. And that's what they did. You know, um, first two hitters rolled over a ball. It's, 
number four, let's see, um, Sean Burrell's big lefties up. He had a P rod down the third baseline foul. And I looked at him and he just had this big grin on his face. <laughs> but he ends up getting on base and this next guy's coming up. It's a right-hander and Louis standing at third base coaching by says, but this guy cannot hit the ball to the right side of the infield. So just be ready. So he hit a bounding ball to my left and I got a really good crossover, I tripped over my feet. And I'm stumbling to keeping my balance, which ain't gonna happen today. My little shortstop that I had signed midway through the season was a rookie, so he's coming in, and I'm stumbling. I'm going to get that ball, and I ran over him. Ball hit him in the chest, and I ran over him and knocked him down. And so I helped him up, and he looked at me, and he said, who gets that error? I said, you do. <laughs> I made my errors, man. Um, but when I got back to the dugout, I had a, they had a big – Tall boy, which was a beer, but they had tape around it said Gatorade. So they gave that to me when I got to the dugout. But you know what? I had to do it, and it's a, a memory I'll never forget. It's a memory that he'll never forget. You know, because Sean mentioned to me in the first couple of years here, I said, why don't you do it here? And I'm going, nah, I don't think so. One's enough. One's enough. Sounds like you're pretty pleased with the way that everything has turned out for you. Is there anything that you wish you could do over in your career? I would have to say for all the young people listening to this, young players, that um, I wish I had never got involved with drugs. Um, I was an Alabama boy, and it was there, and they said, do this, I did it. Um, I regret that. But I think that's probably the only thing. I, I, I mean, I have always said that I'm, blessed to be able to have played for Boston and played for the Angels and played for New York and got to manage the team that I grew up with. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. So, um, But I, I think that's one part of my life that I think I've made amends for by some of the things I've done in my life and talking to young people about drugs and alcohol abuse and the things that can bring you down and, and really hurt your life. So. You know, I, I, I regret that part of my life. When all this is said and done and you're done, done coaching, done managing teams, what do you want your players now, or future players, past players, to remember about Butch Hobson? That I loved him. Plain and simple.